Uh, okay. Uh, hello, everyone. This is Adit Shankar. Uh, welcome to the first session of the Indian Economy webinar series hosted by the Economic Society of Ashoka University. Uh, even though it does seem fairly straightforward, I feel obligated to tell you all briefly about how the title of the series came to be. Um, we first thought of, uh, you know, titling this, centering the series around COVID-19. But then we thought that might be too narrow. Then we thought about, you know, global economy in general, but that didn't seem to have the same ring to it. So we thought of the Indian economy, something fairly specific to keep us all interested while also being broad enough to cover a large span of topics that delve into the past, present and future of the Indian economy. Um, over the next few weeks, we hope to bring to you more such sessions like this and uh, stimulate conversations around the economy and the government's response to it. And uh, hopefully it can lead to some great ideas stringing. Uh, to inaugurate the series, uh, we have Professor Pulapre Balakrishnan uh, with us today, and he's going to be speaking about the macroeconomic cons uh, consequences of the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, Pulapre Balakrishnan is Professor of Economics at Ashoka University. He has previously held appointments at Oxford, uh, in the Indian Statistical Institute at Delhi, uh, and IIM Kozi Kode. His articles have appeared in several professional journals, but perhaps his most well-known works are his books, Pricing and Inflation in India, and Economic Growth in India, History and Prospect. In the past few weeks, he has been writing extensively on the current state of the Indian economy and the, on, uh, and the government's response uh, to the several problems that have been occurring in light of the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, so uh, I'll request Professor uh, Balakrishnan to take over the mantle and start the session. Thank you so much. All right, can you hear me, Adit? Yes, Professor. Yeah. Okay. So I'll be passing it over to you now. Thank you very much, Adit, uh, and the rest of your team for having invited me to participate in your webinar. Uh, let me mention, I, I heard you before the audio went off, I heard you briefly about your, uh, the considerations that went into choice of uh, the title for the series. And I must say, that it's uh, very well chosen for the simple reason that uh, hopefully we will not be living with COVID permanently. <laughs> so we don't want a seminar series on, uh, on COVID. We want a seminar series on India's economy and uh, yeah, and how we build a good one, right? So um, now let me then move on directly to talking about, uh, yeah, let me also, before I start, um, uh, I'll start my presentation, which I'm sorry to say is almost entirely in slides. Uh, but I will, of course, uh, come on, on, on screen soon after that. Uh, and, and hopefully we'll have a great uh, uh, discussion from our end. Oh, dear. Doesn't matter. Okay. All right. I'm sorry, everybody. This has uh, been, uh, I'm sure it's a little frustrating for you, but uh, that's how it is. So I'm going to speak on the macroeconomic consequences of COVID-19. The next slide, please. So the theme of my talk today is that the COVID-19 pandemic we are faced with is a large and persistent event. I shall dwell on both the aspects, that it is large and that it is persistent. I shall start, with by, start by analyzing its possible macroeconomic fallout emphasizing the theoretical issues that have been raised. This is partly because a large number of participants are my, the students from my macroeconomics theory course of about two years ago, and I thought it'd be particularly interesting for them to be uh, alerted to the theoretical aspects. So, and I shall end uh, my talk with the consideration of the Indian situation. Next slide, please. So the COVID-19 induced recession is seen as the deepest for the world economy since the Great Depression. Uh, for the United States where data is available uh, almost on a real time basis, uh, it's possible to make these uh, 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 observations. For India, it's more difficult. However, uh, yeah, however, uh, uh, private estimates show unemployment to have risen sharply. The official data for the first quarter of fiscal 2021, which is April to June of this financial year, uh, uh, are not out. But as I said, 
private estimates are by the CMIE, the Center for Monitoring the Indian Economy, and they show unemployment to have risen sharply. Next slide. So given the magnitude of the shock, there has been a call for the use of aggressive, never used and never ending policies. The core of my talk will really be about these three, three aspects of the policy necessary to respond to COVID. And I repeat that the pro proposals are that they should be aggressive, uh, possibly never used in the past, and uh, more intriguingly, never ending by Krugman. Yeah? And uh, th th these calls are based on the recognition that we're living in exceptional times caused by COVID-19. Next slide. So there are three questions of interest. Uh, first, how long will the recession last? We all desperately want to know this, don't we? How different is this one from previous recessions? Could the recession le lead to a crisis? Yeah, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which is long lasting. Next slide, please. So rather than separate them out, uh, separate um, 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 them out, the answers to these questions by me are best addressed to together. And that's what I should do. So first and foremost, some aspects of this recession make earlier ones a poor guide. And I, uh, you will see in a minute, a especially the recession which has just passed, uh, which is uh, the global financial crisis uh, centered on 2008. Uh, that is probably not such a great guide to what we're going to face today. Uh, and I'll tell you in a minute why we say that or why I say that. So the next slide, please. So uh, a feature of the, uh, a principal feature, in fact, with the COVID-induced recession may make it appear as if a quick recovery would be possible. Remember, the first question I had asked uh, was... Um, how long will the recession last? And there's reason to believe that the recession may not very really last long. The economy could bounce back. Now, why do we say that? We say that the, the shock, the economic shock due to COVID-19 was in the form of lockdown, which placed restriction on output or on production is a better word. So cannot the lifting of the lockdown lead to output bouncing back would go the reasoning. Now, um, You'll see in a minute why, uh, while uh, such a bouncing back uh, uh, may not be something we can expect uh, to happen very readily at this moment. Going back to the global financial crisis for comparison, the global financial crisis uh, was a debt crisis involving banks, uh, which required a fairly intricate resolution before anything else was possible especially the resumption of bank lending necessary for economic activity to come back. So from that point of view, one would imagine the global financial crisis uh, was a crisis uh, uh, in which the, the recession that was the debt crisis, uh, the recession induced by which would uh, last long, uh, but on the other hand, uh, the recession induced due to COVID-19 may not last long. All right, so, so next slide, please. Uh, uh, this time, i.e. with the COVID-19 crisis, as opposed to the global financial crisis of 2008, the shock came in the real sector, i.e. where production is carried on, as opposed to the financial sector. Now, uh, uh, due to the lockdown, production was curtailed. This aspect, as I've said earlier, makes for the possibility of a quick recovery, unlike in the case of the global financial crisis, where an intricate uh, uh, a resolution of the crisis is necessary, capitalization of banks, etc. That technically is not necessary at this moment. But even here, we may expect some differences across the economy, i.e. even if in principle a quick recovery is possible once a lockdown is lifted. Uh, differentiated by the type of their activity, some sectors may require the continuation of re restrictions even after the lockdown is lifted. Uh, hotels and restaurants, travel and leisure, and of course, education are the main examples of this, where there is not possible. Uh, uh, we may, the lockdown may have to 
remain for some more time. Okay, the next slide. All right. So as I mentioned, um, uh, even if the lockdown is lifted, uh, we would expect services to recover more slowly than manufacturing for the simple reason that uh, services may uh, require to uh, be locked down for a slightly lower, a longer period because shows, social distancing is so difficult in, in uh, 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 restaurants, hotels, leisure venues, and so many other places. So services like to recover, likely to recover more slowly than manufacturing. This is of significance for India where the services sector is very large. Yeah. So um, I have been um, speaking about the direct effect of a shock, which is, takes a form, which in the case of a lockdown in, under COVID-18 takes a form of a cessation of production. But the fact is that uh, 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 even uh, after the lockdown has been lifted, forces which have been set in motion while the economy was experiencing a lockdown may actually now come into play. And that's what I'm going to speak about when you talk about the indirect effects of a shock. A factor that complicates recovery is that there are indirect effects of a supply side shock that was that of the supply side shock that was a lockdown. A lockdown lowers output, which lowers income. This has a direct impact on aggregate demand. The impact of current consumption is obvious. That on investment is less so. Why do I say that the impact on consumption is obvious? It's obvious because consumption is a function of income. As income is lower, uh, uh, consumption is lower. So aggregate demand would be lower. Uh, the, recession would last a little longer. But, but the uh, uh, impact on uh, investment uh, is, is much less obvious. Why is that so? Investment of, is based on expectation and that therefore it not expectation of future uh, uh, demand uh, and need not be affected by the, by, by, by the present. But the accelerator may come into play and it is related to the current state of the economy. Let me just remind everybody what the accelerator is. The accelerator is the impact on current, of current output or income on investment, as opposed to the multiplier, which as you know, is the impact on output or income of investment, right? So you can see we are, we are setting up a story here. So now we can conceive of a downward spiral post the lockdown due to the interaction of aggregate demand and aggregate supply, or more precisely of the multiplier and the accelerator. The indirect effects of a supply side shock, these indirect effects of a supply shock, uh, side shock can be significant. And the long-term impact of a shock is captured by the idea of hysteresis. Hysteresis, by the way, is a, an idea that comes from uh, electrical engineering and, and, and physics also to some extent. Uh, without going into the technical details, I'll just emphasize what is relevant for us here. Hysteresis refers to the existence of memory in the system, in this case, the economic system which gives rise to two related phenomena, which you, uh, when, you, when, when I uh, explain what these related phenomena are, you will understand what is meant by existence of memory in the economic system. So the first is that the level of output is history de dependent in the sense that where output will be tomorrow uh, can be a function of where it is today, right? So uh, output is history dependent. Now, shocks can have a permanent effect, right? Shocks which lower the level of output today may, may have a permanent depressing impact on output tomorrow. So, uh, thus a cyclical downturn, i.e. Um, any, any reduction in, in output, which even if it is, uh, if it is reversed in the future, uh, uh, can be long-lasting. No? A cyclical down, downturn can be long-lasting. Uh, uh, or the effect of a cyclical downturn is a better way to put it, can be long, long lasting and it affects the trend, which is the long term trajectory of the economy. 
So let's let's uh, go back and think a little bit about cycles in economic theory. Then then you will see why uh, histories is very important. In the history of economic thought, growth and cycles have been treated as independent of one another. So that's in the solo model, which all of you remember from your uh, macroeconomics course in the solo model of growth, when growth is driven by exogenous technical progress, or rather, in the solo model of growth, uh, I should have said it should be where growth rather than when growth, where growth is driven by exogenous technical progress. The growth rate is not affected by fluctuations. Yeah, fluctuations don't really matter. The economy just moves on to its uh, so-called steady state growth path. Yeah, uh, uh, in, the, in business cycle theory, Cycles were deviation from a position of economic equilibrium. Huh? Uh, cycles do not affect uh, the, the, the long-term trajectory of the economy. But uh, 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 hysteresis uh, uh, challenges the idea, or the, uh, the notion of hysteresis challenges the idea that cyclical fluctuations or what appear to be temporary shocks uh, 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 will not have long-term effects. I, history says it suggests that temporary shocks will have long-term effects. Yeah? So the application of the idea uh, uh, of history says to economics has led to the recognition that fluctuations can affect the long-term performance of an economy. And this happens via labor markets or via drivers of long-term growth. I, I don't have enough time to elaborate upon this, so I'll just give a, uh, a, a kind of uh, uh, a, a, uh, a very quick overview of, of, of the, uh, of the um, uh, manner in which uh, hysteresis works to depress long-term output. Huh? An elaboration may be found in this paper by Chera, Fata, and Saxena, the exact references to which I will give at the end of this talk. Yeah. So channels to which te temporary shocks produce permanent effects, yeah? and that is what history is all about, right? Job losses can lead to, to history in employment, including job losses resulting from the, uh, uh, from the uh, 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 resulting in the loss of skills, uh, which leads to discourage, the discouraged worker effects. Let me just mention, uh, mention that if skills are lost because people are unemployed for some time, their productivity will be lower, right? As their productivity is lower, they become less attractive for hiring, right? And therefore, employment would be lower. Uh, uh, and, and therefore, job what, what appear to be temporary job losses due to the lockdown could lead to a history in employment, i.e. a long-lasting effect on uh, employment in the economy, right? There's also the discouraged worker effect whereby a, a worker who has been unemployed, uh, just drops out of the labor market. When he drops out of the labor market, he's no longer there to be employed in the economy, right? So in India, hysteresis may also emerge in the case of migrant workers from their experience of lockdown, i.e. Uh, as a lockdown was not a very pleasant experience for migrant workers, many of whom have now returned to their villages, they may not return even after the lockdown is lifted, or they may take time to return. And in the period a period uh, during which they are still stuck in their villages, output is lower, and that's a permanent loss of output. Notice we're not, never going to re recover that purely because time moves forward. Time is an arrow, right? So that is the manner in which um, uh, uh, the impact on shock of sh temporary shocks on labor markets can lead to hysteresis in employment. Now. There is also the impact of, uh, of uh, history also works by if the, uh, the impact on shocks, by, of, of shocks on the drivers of long-term growth in the economy. If human capital accumulation slows, either from the disruption of schooling or learning by doing, uh, the economy's supply potential is impacted, i.e. the long-term supply potential of the economy is lower, or potential output is lower. What is uh, the, this, uh, the what is learning by doing? Let me remind you. Uh, it is refers to the increase in, in productivity that comes purely out of repeating a task again and again, eh, which makes people more adept at it. 
but also gives rise to the possibility of doing it better. So now, um, it, it, and learning by doing is a function of accumulated output. When there is, when, when there are shocks which will lower accumulated output in the long run, the economy's supply potential is impacted. Uh, I do believe, however, uh, anxieties about uh, disruption of schooling, etc., for six months, may, etc., may be a little exaggerated. But the um, uh, impact on long-term output of the loss of skills and uh, the reduction of uh, learning by doing is very real indeed. Now let's look at something which is quite important, which is the financial sector impacts. Rising debt and weak demand can lead to a deterioration of balance sheets of firms, right? Uh, why is this, why is this so? Uh, why does the balance sheets of firms in the economy deteriorate? Uh, firms who have to continue to, uh, uh, to bear some uh, fixed costs even during the lockdown. Uh, but they have no revenues. If they have no revenues, while well, they have to have um, you know expenditure on costs, the balance sheets work weaken. So this is the um, balance sheets of financial firms first, and firms in the real sector later. Now, as far as the real sector is concerned, where production takes place, the rising debt of real sector firms, uh, which face the same situation, i.e., they have fixed costs, but the revenues are low or non-existent. Um, which increases the prob probability of financial distress, uh, can make risk-averse banks reduce the availability of credit. As the availability of credit is lower, um, the production is affected also. Now, the real sector impact, uh, expectation of lower demand and productivity in the future can dampen business investment. So uh, if firms um, begin to... Uh, uh, develop uh, 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 or form very negative expectations of what the level of demand is going to be in the future, um, then they will invest less, right? Because investment is driven by um, the, uh, the possibility of future uh, output being high, so that uh, profits will be forthcoming. Now, interestingly enough, in this situation, if banks went ahead and made loans to, 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 to struggling real sector firms and the recovery does not take place quickly enough, there could be a permanent deterioration in the balance sheets of both firms and banks, especially banks, excuse me, thus prolonging the recession, uh, prolonging the recession through a crisis, in this case, a financial crisis. Banks have lent, the recovery has not taken place, uh, and, and uh, yeah, uh, we have a crisis on our hands. We have seen that there are several ways in which a short-term fluctuation, these are all several ways in which a short-term fluctuation that reduces output can have long-term scarring effects on the economy. Uh, it's as if these temporary shocks, in this case, the lockdown and the loss of output due to COVID-19 has left a scar on the economy. Hysteresis effects are a distinct possibility for any economy and certainly also for India. Now, what are econ possible economic policies in a world with hysteresis? Uh, 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 now, the cost of, when there is hysteresis, the cost of cyclical shocks is greater due to their potential long-term consequences. Therefore, aggressive and fast action is needed to counter depressing forces or forces in the economy that lead to uh, leaving the output depressed in the future. Yeah? All right. So, remember, we talked about uh, actions which were have not or policies which have not been used in the past, huh? never used and never ending, right? So that uh, I'm going to come to that in a minute. Yeah. Uh, so, but now, what does depression do? What are the implications of depression? Uh, the implications, sorry, the implications of history sees policies that dampen fluctuations can affect the supply side positively. I.e. Uh, um, um, you know, policies that dampen fluctuations and ensure that hysteresis effects do not take uh, take uh, take hold means that the long term uh, supply potential output of the economy will be higher. The increase in supply lowers inflation in the future. Yeah, so that's a positive thing. And when there is hysteresis, uh, note that when there is hysteresis, the cost of policy mistakes can be large, right? The policy mistake that could happen is not acting sufficiently fast or sufficiently aggressively, and you're going to have a recession that lasts long 
uh, or, or also a and or also a financial crisis. The macroeconomic policy response to the possibility of a long drawn out recession must be commensurate to the challenge. That is, that is significant. Huh? It must be commensurate to the challenge. We've all, all already referred to the worsening balance sheets of firms and banks. In principle, the government can help and uh, can step in and assist firms with funding for their unavoidable expenses during the lockdown without increasing their liabilities. But these fiscal transfers only transfer the liabilities of firms onto the government budget. To finance the transfers, the government would have to either raise taxes or borrow on the capital markets. Taxes aggravate the already existing demand shortage and borrowing raises public debt, which is considered undesirable in certain circles. But there is a solution to this problem of how to finance the higher government spending. And this is direct, unrepayable funding by the central bank of the additional fiscal spending deemed necessary due to the emergency, due to the pan uh, pandemic. And this is referred to as money financing, i.e. money financing of fiscal outlays. Uh, I have quoted from the work of uh, le uh, economist who uh, a, 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 leading, uh, a leading authority on monetary policy, uh, Jordi Gali, the exact reference I will give you towards the end of the um, uh, this session. And what does Gali have to say? The central bank could credit the government's account of governments. Uh, in the case of ECB, that's also relevant to us. But governments in the case of, well, it is relevant in an interesting way. He's referring to Europe. So he's talking of the European Central Bank and how the European Central Bank has to deal with many national governments in Europe. So it would, uh, it would credit the accounts of all these governments. And, and uh, remember, uh, this has direct relevance to India. Uh, so the Reserve Bank ca can credit the accounts of the governments of, of the states in India also, right? So that's what this uh, statement is, is, is saying. For the, uh, could credit the government's account for the amount of the additional transfers and the, for the duration of the program. That credit would not be repayable, i.e. it would amount to a transfer from the central bank to the government. Such a transfer, says Gali, uh, from the central bank to the government would be equivalent to a commensurate purchase of government debt by the central bank, followed by its immediate writing off. That's no longer having an impact on the government's effective debt liabilities. Notice why we, 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 we are even considering helicopter money. We're considering helicopter money or, or, or money financing of the, or, 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 of the deficit or fiscal expenditure only because out of concerns about the public debt. Should we concern, be very concerned about the level of public debt in India at any rate? I'll come to that in due course. Yeah, so this intervention has been called helicopter money. I'm going to uh, rush through this, I'm sorry, mainly because uh, uh, 45 minutes of the presentation are already over. Uh, so let me just move on very quickly. Money financed, sorry, sorry can we go back? Money finance uh, fiscal intervention raises a number of questions. What is the extent to which firms must be funded? This is a practical issue, of, of, of course, but it is yet second order relative to the macroeconomic challenge at the moment. And the macroeconomic challenge is very, very real. It's one of extended, uh, extended, uh, of an extended recession. Now, in some countries, uh, such intervention, i.e. money financing of the, of the uh, um, fiscal deficit by the central bank is not permitted by law. The FRBM Act in, in, in the Indian case comes close to this, but the point is very simple, that the law can be amended. We, we shouldn't really be always saying, well, the law doesn't allow it, change the law, right? It's as simple as that. Now, uh, what is the third consideration? The mechanism may be misused by government, goes the argument, that the government will constantly uh, uh, resort to money financing, whereby the central bank is uh, forced to finance uh, any expenditure the government wants. Now, um, this, of course, can be guarded against by stipulating that its use is confined to emergencies alone, i.e., in, in this case, so long as the recession lasts. 
money finance fiscal intervention is a powerful tool and should be used by governments when needed. And I, uh, my, my, the point that I'm making uh, is that money financing is something that the government should seriously consider. Indeed, it is the only tool available when monetary policy is ineffective, I, uh, either if banks are, uh, are unwilling to lend, especially if banks are unwilling to lend, and there is concern, and there is concern about the level of debt in this situation. The only option that you really have is money financing. Now, uh, th th there are fears, fears is missing from that statement. There are fears that large scale monetization will result in a major inflation episode. So far, uh, but this is by the economist Blanchard and Pisani Ferry. Uh, and they say, so far, there is no evidence that central banks have given up or are preparing to give up of their price stability mandate, i.e. what this is suggesting is that, yes, if there is inflation in the future, and you believe central banks can control inflation, they have the means to do so. They do this by raising the interest rate at that point, right? So you don't want to uh, prevent money financing from happening by constantly referring to the fear of inflation. Now, when, uh, they also say, interestingly, now when the possible consequences of money financing are considered, it ought not to be overlooked that inflation lowers the real value of public debt. Uh, this, this is not something you should completely overlook. India, and this is the last part of my presentation. The so-called stimulus in May was dominated by monetary policy, overly focused as it was on providing liquidity. Yeah. Uh, uh, remember, it, it took mainly the form, the overwhelming part of it uh, was, as far as the government is concerned, had to do with uh, the Reserve Bank uh, uh, making uh, liquidity available to banks under various provisions to lend, right? Lend long term, including lend long term. Responding to a recession while liquidity provision is a gamble. Quite simply, banks may yet not lend, even if they have the capacity to do so. Why is that? We've already considered that. Risk averse banks may be unwilling to lend to, uh, to uh, uh, firms uh, which could go bankrupt, uh, mainly because their revenues uh, are, are stalled. Firms may not resume production, leave alone invest. So, uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, so uh, when, when that is the case, the, even if liquidity is available, firms may not be willing to take on more debt. When the problem is an aggregate demand shortfall, as in my view it is now, monetary policy is generally considered ineffective. Historically, the expression uh, that has been used uh, for the use of monetary policy in a, uh, in the, in a situation of uh, recession is that uh, it's rather like pushing on a string. Uh, you should try pushing on a string. It's not possible, right? You can only pull on it. However, I'm willing to keep my mind open and wait and see. I personally am willing to keep my mind open and wait and see what the result of government's 3 lakh crore package for the MSME sector will be, i.e. Whether, whether the banks will now lend to the MSME sector. Remember, this um, 3 lakh crore package took the form of the government providing a guarantee to loans made to the uh, small and medium enterprises sector. All right. So, um, uh, could we have the pre 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 previous slide? Yeah, so uh, the, uh, uh, the argument for fiscal expansion, which I make, uh, is personally based on the presumption that monetary policy is likely to be ineffective. That spending is likely to be most effective. Uh, 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 that spending, i.e. the spending that is most likely to be effective is infrastructure spending. There has been no announcement of expanded public spending on infrastructure in India since March. I, I say since March because March is when the uh, COVID pandemic really hit us. It has been estimated that the additional spending by the government in response to the pandemic has been of the order of uh, less than 2 lakh crore, somewhere between 1.5 and 2 percent of India's GDP for 2019-20, compared to the additional spending amounting to uh, approximately 10 percent of GDP in the US and over 15 percent in Japan and I might also add uh, and Germany. As a consequence of the additional spending in the United States, according to the Congressional Budget Office, this fiscal deficit is expected to rise from around 3% of GDP to 14% of GDP. All of this is suggesting that the, the, the rest of the world has been much more aggressive in responding to the 
uh, uh, to the crisis uh, via fiscal stimulus. And I just want to clarify something. What I want to clarify is that very often the argument is made, well, those are rich countries, they can afford to. We are not saying, or it is I am not saying that India should spend the same amount as the United States or Japan or Germany. I'm just trying to say that India should be spent, spend much more in relation to its own GDP. Remember all of this, uh, the stimulus data that I've given across the world and for India is the stimulus as a share of GDP. And, it, and once again, in the case of India, it's less than 2%. In the case of the United States, it's about 10% of GDP. India has, has seen what has been adjudged, adjudged internationally, that is, the most stringent lockdown and the least effective stimulus package of the major economies of the world. This should be considered a major failing of governments. So uh, there has been a new view of fiscal policy ever since the global financial crisis, which is basically suggesting that uh, fiscal policy may not be so uh, so uh, ineffective as it's made out to be. There could be clouding in and so crowding out to private investment, i.e. that when, when public investment rises uh, 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 via fiscal policy, uh, uh, um, private investment would rise. Now, why would that happen? There's a very good economic reason. The economic reason is that, uh, uh, the economic reason is that, uh, uh, um, demand the market has expanded because of public investment um, potential profits in the private sector are greater so as public investment rises even if it's uh, the debt driven private investment could rise uh, so um, um, uh, as part of the new um, our new view of fiscal policy paul krugman has proposed the idea of a permanent fiscal stimulus why does he talk about of a permanent fiscal stimulus he says and uh, these are his words because of the politics of fiscal stimulus. Uh, every time a fiscal stimulus is needed, uh, we are scrambling for some kind of short-term response. Instead of that, it makes sense to have a permanent stimulus. And I, I will uh, use his own words to so be very clear what he has in mind. I hereby propose, says Stugman, that the next US president and, and the Congress, the United States Congress, move to permanently spending an additional 2% of GDP on public investment, broadly uh, 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 defined infrastructure for sure, he says, but also things like R&D and child development and not pay for it. Uh, uh, Krugman's example is for an economy with very low interest rates. Uh, just a minute, I have my student, former student, Adhiraj Mathu's, uh, message which has come up which i'll answer which is blocking my slide okay it's popped popped away now it's vanished i can read it krugman's example is for an economy with very low interest rates and public debt which is the case in the united states which make for a growth rate higher than the interest rate yeah this of course is more relevant to the united states economy where government can borrow at very low rates yeah that's not necessarily possible in, the, in india However, two points that Krugman makes uh, which are relevant for India and which I think is really worth studying. First, the idea that public investment in infrastructure, health and r and remain important for so rich an economy as the United States. Can you imagine how much more relevant it is for an economy such as India uh, where, where public capital is exceptionally low? And uh, this was really an opportunity for us to, uh, to step it up, public capital and roads and bridges, uh, uh, sewerage systems, uh, urban infrastructure, sidewalks, uh, uh, etc. Right? Uh, and secondly, the proposition that high debt is bound to lead to a crisis is exaggerated. That is Krugman's view. Uh, and he cites the case of Japan today and the UK historically to make this point. In Japan today, the size of the debt is, uh, can we just go back? Yeah, the size of the debt in Japan is about 200% of GDP. Uh, the, as he says, in the UK, it has in recent past, it has been uh, 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 at the historically high level of 150% of GDP. In India right now, it's about 70% of GDP. All right. Uh, so, so uh, yeah. Now, I just want to say something in passing. One of the arguments that have been made against fiscal expansion, especially when it's debt driven, but remember what I say, just Am I audible, Adit? Yes, Professor. Okay, okay thank you. I'm sorry. I, I apologize to everybody. I'm sorry about this connectivity issue. So I, I, I was talking about, uh, about um, 
the possibility of capital flight and this is is a real possibility we should we should be uh, aware of it yeah but india's response response to this problem should be of the following kind we should be willing to impose import control sorry not import controls i apologize controls on capital flight in an emergency now i i, I really don't believe uh, that you should allow capital flight to so and many countries at many times uh, in their history have used the Malaysia being a very good example in 1997 and with very good 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 effects for its economy. Hello Adi. Yes professor I can hear you. Okay uh, so, so uh, once again uh, we should be uh, open to imposing controls on capital flight in an emergency but we should from a and this is a more short to medium term thing we should be seriously uh, uh, considering reducing our dependence on short-term capital flows to finance our, our balance of payments deficit. Uh, uh, we can do this only by exporting more and also finding, um, finding possibly in the, in, in the uh, form of solar energy where the economy has had some success. I just want to say here, self-reliance is surely a worthy goal, but it's, uh, there is a question whether Atmanirbhar Bharat uh, rush through my presentation so that we, 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 we don't have this problem again. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? Yeah, thank you. So, uh, 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 as part of the, uh, as I said, there's been a new view of fiscal policy, uh, uh, and we should consider this. And, and let, me, let me make some suggestions that come out of the new view of fiscal policy. The COVID-19 uh, epidemic has exposed the weakness of the health and physical a health and physical infrastructure in India, right? We've been reading about dead bodies piling up in hospitals. Uh, there has been no way of uh, scientifically uh, disposing of uh, uh, dead bodies, uh, you know, leave alone allowing people a dignified uh, uh, ending uh, once they die. And all this is uh, a... a, 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 a reflection of the very poor health infrastructure in this country, including san sanitation workers not having a personal protective and equipment and all the rest of it. Now, fiscal policy has the potential of change in this landscape. And it's very, very interesting uh, that this idea has come out of the IMF in 2015. I don't have time to discuss it because I want to discuss the questions if I can. So I won't discuss this slide. I don't know if the organizers will share slides with the participants. I, I, I'm happy that they do so. Let me just move on. And I just, so I'm, I'm, uh, the next slide, please. Yeah, and the IMF has given several ways in which fiscal policy can affect medium to long term growth, and it does this via our, 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 our public investment. Next slide, please. Yeah. So uh, this is the key point that I want to make. The IMF speaks about efficient public investment, especially in infrastructure, can raise the economy's productive capacity. And thus, private productivity. Remember that, right? Public infrastructure contributes to private productivity. And I just want you to, since you're all from Ashoka, uh, reflect on the scenes that we encounter on the road from uh, Jahangir Puri to the uh, uh, university's campus, the garbage mountains, the foul air, uh, the terrible uh, infrastructure while you wait for the bus, the traffic jam, the amount of time that this, uh, this takes away from productive activity, uh, and how much efficient uh, public capital, efficiently functioning uh, public infrastructure, how much of a difference it can make to private productivity. And this idea, by the way, is coming from the IMF. It's very interesting. Huh? Uh, and it, IMF also speaks about more equitable access to education and healthcare contributes to human capital accumulation, a key factor for growth. And I just want to say here, uh, uh, with the lockdown, uh, we have seen the extraordinary negative impact it has had on poor households, uh, which don't have access to uh, computers, laptops, uh, internet uh, connectivity. There is a serious sco scope for government to intervene here and try and do something uh, as far as improving uh, digital access or uh, 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 lowering the digital 
uh, divide in this country. And, and, and that's what the IMF is talking about when it talks about equitable access to uh, education. It's also talked about equitable uh, 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 access to uh, health. So much, I want to say, I'm, I'm, I'm headed towards conclusion. Huh? Much of the new thinking in the area of fiscal policy, once again, that fiscal deficits uh, may, may have a, a may, may not be so damaging after all. Public investment is helpful. Public investment raises private productivity. Private public investment uh, increases um, the possibility of private investment via clouding in. Uh, and there is a possibility of increasing public investment without relying on public debt or increasing public debt in the country if you uh, go, go via the route of monetary financing. All of this is coming out of an idea of the new view of fiscal policy. And I want to say much of the new thinking in the area of fiscal policy has had little impact on the economic policy in India, where the government appears to be fixated on the fiscal deficit. Using economic judgment, in my view, is superior to adhering to numerically set targets, ostensibly valid for all situations. And it doesn't take very much to realize that we are not facing uh, a normal situation now. Much of the macroeconomic policy pursued in India over the past decade is a barrier to growth and the building of an economy that serves our needs, i.e. we're not only interested in growth, but we're also interested in an economy that uh, contributes to our well-being, and, and some part of that comes out of public infrastructure, and only the government can build public infrastructure, right? And macroeconomic policy must be geared towards that. Macroeconomic policy in India, in my view, is completely unsuited to the challenges the country faces. For close to a decade now, public investment from the central budget is less than 2%. A central budget in India is less than 2% recommended by Krugman for the US economy. Uh, let me repeat uh, that the US economy is far richer than us, and Krugman is suggesting far higher public investment uh, as a share of GDP. Can, can labor emerge as a supply constraint? It can, yeah. Uh, but if migrant labor have a problem coming back, yes, or, or do not come back, labor can emerge as a supply constraint uh, in the economy. Carry on. Yeah, so let me just uh, conclude by looking at the central government's response uh, to the, to the, uh, to the economic, possible likely economic consequences of COVID-19 in India uh, uh, in terms of all the theoretical considerations that I have raised. The re re in my view, the response of the government even to the likely COVID-induced recession is incommensurate i.e. not commensurate with the consequences or the impact. Assuming production is spread evenly across the year, the two-month lockdown may be estimated to have wiped out the equivalent of a sixth of GDP for 2019. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah, sixth, sixth of GDP for 2019-20, for which was uh, uh, at 203 lakh crores. I said assume the lower figure of a tenth of the GDP, yielding a figure of approximately 20 lakh crores for the loss of production. So what does this suggest? The figure of, this suggests a figure of 20 lakh crores for a commensurate stimulus. That would amount to about 10% of the GDP, which I assume is the direct impact of COVID in terms of production loss during the lockdown. The PM in his speech of May 2nd, I think it's May 2nd, you can correct me, did announce a stimulus of exactly this magnitude. Details were to come later. Carry on. The next slide. Uh, uh, these details were extremely disappointing. When the finance minister announced the details, the additional spending announced over six weeks, uh, i.e. between end March and early May, uh, were estimated to come to approximately 2% of the GDP, or less than 2% of the GDP, GDP is what's been estimated. The rest of the so-called stimulus was the form of liquidity provision by the GDP, RBI and funds for lending provision by the government, which were located in financial institutions such as NABAR, these, in my view, do not count as a stimulus. Only a direct injection of demand in the form of additional spending count, can count as a stimulus, i.e. Uh, a, 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 a stimulus uh, a, a is uh, an injection which has potential to increase income in the economy. Liquidity provision is not. Now, I want to say something on the state government's response. We know very little of the actions of the state governments. We focus exclusively, and in my view, I believe excessively, on the actions of the central government. 
Kerala did assume a fair, did announce a fairly substantial relief package early on. But I don't know how much Kerala is doing about infrastructure. Kerala's record in building infrastructure is not very great. Yeah. The effects of the pandemic can be substantially offset only the in India, that is only the state governments. If the states, I had man, there's a typo there, I'm sorry, take a proactive role both in providing relief and reconstructing their economies to be more resilient in the future. Right now, we know very little of how the states have responded. The next. And this is a conclusion. The government of India has responded with stringent measures aimed at containing the spread of the virus, but very weakly towards mitigating the impact of the economic shock. I've gone through this and the, the, the extent of the stimulus, etc. I want to conclude by saying it is not too late to effect a strong fiscal stimulus to India's economy. Thank you very much and I'll take questions now. Thank you so much, Professor. And that was a really insightful talk. And thanks everyone for attending today's webinar. We've received a lot of really good questions, but in the interest of time, we've narrowed it down to maybe four or five questions. So, Professor, shall I read out the questions now? You, you could. Um, 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 Samyukta, I don't mind. Uh, sorry, you're there, anchor, and I leave it to you, but I don't mind really sharing my response. Can everybody hear me when I speak? Can everybody hear me? I suppose they can, right? Yeah. Yeah? So, so, yeah. I just mean I don't mind taking the questions directly, or is that too complicated? If it is, we'll just go with your plan. Yeah, Professor, I think it'd be better if I read it out because a few questions are also anonymous. Oh, I see, okay, anonymous questions, I like that. Okay, okay, fine, <laughs> right. I'll just read out the questions now. The first one's about agriculture. So the question is, recent sowing data indicates a bumper crop in the coming months. To what extent can we expect agriculture to pick up the slack from the services and manufacturing sector? Would the recent reforms have any role to play in this? Well, the question is in two parts, and I agree. And I, in fact, as, as somebody who has some interest in agriculture, I um, uh, should have spoken about agriculture. That, uh, that is an oversight in my talk, and that's absolutely correct. Um, I, I'm not sure just about the sowing data, but also uh, the procurement from the rubby harvest. Uh, which was uh, almost taking place when the lockdown was announced, also have been very favorable and will certainly help the economy. Uh, the only thing is that I'm not sure it can really pick up the slack. That might be too much to expect, but it'll certainly help. Now, as far as the recent reforms are concerned, I'm a strong supporter of those reforms. I think the APMC Act should go. Uh, it is really... Uh, subjected our farmers to hardship and whatever may have been the original intention the form in which these markets evolved were certainly concerning the freedom of farmers and also much more so may have kept the prices that they received depressed so uh, the uh, the uh, uh, the allowing farmers to sell to whomever they want is a very very good thing uh, and the government has not dismantled the APMC, so both arrangements exist at the same time. Uh, uh, now, how much that will make a difference to uh, agriculture, uh, even in the medium run, I don't know. That's because I have the view that Indian agriculture is facing a, a serious uh, ecological undertow. There is a uh, problem relating to ecological factors, the dropping of the water table, uh, the uh, drying up of uh, soil moisture, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. None of which can, of course, be tackled by uh, reforms of the kind that the government has implemented. But the reforms, I think, are, are a good thing. And and, and I think they, they were overdue. Uh, Samyukta, you're muted. Really sorry. No, no, that's fine. To the next question. Uh, what could the impact of the pandemic and lockdown be on, in, on income inequality and intra-regional inequality? Does this pandemic represent an opportunity for labor-heavy supplier states like UP and Bihar to build industries of their own? Or does migrant workers returning to urban centers represent an opportunity missed? Yes, uh, but the, the, the possibility of, of, of inequality worsening is very real. Uh, it's not just inequality, the, the uh, uh, sections of the population may, may, may be forced into 
poverty, that's also a form of hysteresis, right? Long-term effects on income. Your income levels could be depressed for long periods. Uh, they could fall back into the poverty trap, as that's called. That's a distinct possibility. Uh, uh, I, I, yeah, I, I, I'm sorry about, uh, uh, about uh, to sound a little pessimistic on uh, uh, the opportunity that this represents for Bihar and UP, because I'm not sure that their leadership, uh, political leadership, has shown sufficient alertness to the problem, the economic problems of those states. But otherwise, yes, there, there must be many things good about those states. Uh, note the uh, mortality rate from the COVID pandemic is very low in Bihar. I'm not talking of infections, I'm talking the mortality rate. It's also quite low in, in UP. So they have many things going for them. Uh, but uh, unless there is a concerted uh, response from their political leadership, I don't think anything would happen in a hurry in those states as far as keeping their migrants back. And in fact, the migrants from those states are already returning uh, to Mumbai, uh, et cetera. We, we, we read about that in the papers all the time. Uh, so yes, um, uh, yeah. So I, 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 uh, it's an opportunity, but I, I, I have not seen anything from the governments of those states. Of course, UP and Bihar cannot be isolated, I think. Uh, I'm not sure one has seen much about economic thinking from any of the states in, in, in India, uh, including from Kerala. Perhaps it is happening and I'm not informed about that, but we don't read about it. Uh, of course, you know, uh, one, must, uh, one must acknowledge that the states are reeling under the pandemic. But even if that is the case, you should always also be thinking about the future at the same time and sending out the right signals. I'm not sure much, much of that is really happening in India. At the, at the level of the states. Right. Uh, the next question is, there has been a marked increase in healthcare spending across the world, be it in infrastructure or services. What will the macroeconomic effects of the spending be in the long term? And is, there, and is the increase a knee-jerk effect or will it be here to stay? No, I, you know, I'm embarrassed to say that I'm not aware of, uh, of the public uh, spending on infrastructure and healthcare around the world. I mean, I'm sure that, uh, some part of the stimulus must be going, going into that, but I don't know really, uh, uh, really how much, uh, uh, how much of the increased stimulus is going into health. Uh, health. Uh, I'm sure some of it certainly is. Um, uh, so I really can't answer that question, uh, but uh, 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 spending on infrastructure and health is absolutely essential. And I repeat what I have said, if, if, if economists such as Krugman can think that it is important for so rich an economy like the United States, which has pretty good public infrastructure as it is, uh, uh, you can imagine how important that is for an economy such as India, which has so little public capital, right? Uh, uh, and uh, the example of that is 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 uh, is is uh, the the connectivity problems that I am facing on my BSNL connection, you know, I had 160 participants when I started out, I've lost half of them. It's a shame, you know, I mean, that we can't really have better co internet connectivity in this country. And the other is uh, something which we all share when we take, once again, when we uh, journey uh, in the bus from Jahangir Puri to the campus, you can see the absence of public capital in India. You know, Nala is full of sewage, garbage mountains, the, the uh, road is choked, there are no sidewalks. The, the impact that this has on productivity is extremely high, extremely high. So, uh, 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 yeah, so the, the, the lesson, if, if as a speaker said, there is spending on health and infrastructure in the rest of the world, the message of that for India is very, very great that we need to be spending much more than we have so far because we have so little. We have so little of it as of now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'll ask one last question, Professor, because we're almost nearing one and a half hours. So I don't want to keep everyone on for too long. So last question is... Except, uh, Samir, I'm sorry to cut you. Uh, the the call is entirely um, uh, that of all of you, but I don't mind staying on a little more if you think that's appropriate. But I'll leave it to you. I won't come back to this question again. Sure, yeah, yeah, I'll leave it to you. 
Yeah, the question is, despite the recession and the poor state of the economy, why is it that the capital markets in India and the US seem to be rising? That's absolutely a, a very good question. Uh, uh, except that I want to say in the United States, um, uh, I, I think the, there's been some capital market correction. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, in India, no. The, India, uh, the, the capital markets have, have remained... Uh, as steady uh, as they have been. That's, this is a very difficult one. I'm not, not um, quite in a position to answer it because I don't really study, uh, uh, um, um, study uh, uh, what's the word, um, capital markets. I really can't answer this, but I mean, uh, quite simply, it could also reflect the fact that as, uh, as production is, uh, as um, uh, investment in the real sector is set to slow in the future. Uh, there is no real great demand for capital from firms, right? So, so well, where do those with excess capital take their money to? They take it to the stock market for simple reason that, yeah, into the, the secondary markets because there are no public issues, right? So uh, that, that is one way to really understand this. But uh, uh, yeah, I'm sure there's more to it, but I'm, I'm not able to offer very much more on this issue. Uh, Professor, there's another question that I found, which is not really exactly related to the pandemic, but it's about the India-China issue. So the question goes, recently there have been calls for boycotting Chinese products due to border tensions. How viable is this considering China is a significant trade partner and many Indian firms import intermediate goods from their Chinese counterparts? No, that's absolutely, absolutely well put. The question, the, uh, the, well, it's viable, but it'll affect you, it'll cost you. So uh, here the <laughs> essential question is very simple. Uh, do, do, you want to, uh, do you want to do business with somebody who doesn't honor agreements? Uh, and uh, if you feel you don't, then you have to take the economic cost. It's as simple as that. I don't, I don't think it will be a catastrophe of India to, for India to not trade with China, but it will certainly cost, uh, cost India quite a bit. But uh, at the same time, uh, it could have a quite major... Uh, signaling implications globally that India is a country that, that doesn't want to do business with uh, uh, with uh, partners who are not reliable politically, right? Even if it costs them money. So you must be willing to take a cut somewhere. Um, and, and that essentially is the question. The question is not viability, so to speak. The question is how much of a loss are you willing to take? And if, if, if you believe in a principle, then you should be willing to take a loss even if it's quite substantial. Let me just tell you, let me just wrap up by saying India, India did refuse to trade with South Africa during apartheid. Many UK banks refused to trade with, deal with South Africa uh, 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 during the, the apartheid. And I, I must say that uh, students in the UK were very, uh, were at the forefront of the campaign to get banks in the, in the UK to not invest in South Africa and that work. So globally, we do have examples where, where countries do stand up for principle. It does affect them, but uh, yeah, it, it really believe, it depends on how strongly you believe in the principle. But Professor, I think those are the questions for now. There were a thank lot you. Yeah, thank but thank you so much for spending your time with us today and thanks to everyone who came to attend the webinar. I um, just wanted to end by saying that we're gonna we've recorded this whole session and we'll be posting a we'll be posting it on YouTube and sharing a link to that on our Ashoka Twitter page on our Ashoka Economic Society Twitter page, and also want to let you guys know that there'll be more webinars coming soon in the next month or so, so do stay tuned for those. Thank you so much, Professor, once again. No, no, no. But Samantha, I just have a last question. Yes. Uh, uh, if you don't call off. Uh, immediately, of course, uh, uh, the, the session's closed. I appreciate that. Can I uh, answer some of the Q&As uh, by mail or is that messy? Sure, I think that could be possible. Um, one second. Or is that too difficult? In which case... Uh, Professor, uh, I think we can make a document with all of the questions and then just send them to you, perhaps through email. Yeah, I don't mind. Okay. Do that. Do it, send it as a Word document and I will just type in 